Well, welcome everyone to the uh, 26th annual Fields on Wheels conference. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you here today. Uh, the theme this year is congestion and logistical challenges in the late pandemic. It seems to me that the pandemic has lasted a lot longer than anyone uh, thought or guessed. Personally, I thought it was over in six months from now, at least three times. And it looks like it may be even extended a bit longer. Let's hope that it does not. But congestion and logistical challenges certainly abound. We've had severe weather events like the, the drought in the prairies this summer and the torrential rains that knocked out the roads and, and rails to the port of Vancouver. Well, this is just on top of the congestion that was there uh, with the pandemic. So getting back to where we were, it's not going to be easy. And in some cases, uh, maybe we won't go back to the way we were. Uh, this webinar perhaps is an example of that adjustment, uh, but it's not all bad. Uh, today, we have people joining us from long distances that maybe wouldn't be able to attend if we had to come in person. And, and that's really uh, nice. And, and we really appreciate them making the effort to be with us today. Uh, also, <clears throat> I'm pleased to welcome over 300 delegates to join us today. Again, uh, with the cost of travel and registration, I don't know that we would have a number like that uh, ever, uh, but today we do it with the, the virtual conference and, and that certainly is appreciated. Of course, uh, none of this would be possible if we didn't have the support of our sponsors. Uh, you'll see their names uh, roll through during the breaks and, and earlier. And again, thank you to our sponsors for helping us. Uh, it makes it possible for us to offer this to everyone as a free conference. And uh, that, of course, uh, encourages more people who can attend and join us. <clears throat> the Fields on Wheels is a joint effort, uh, both the Faculty of Agriculture and Food, as well as the Asper School of Business joined together to do this. And we thank you for our partners in agriculture for their help. Uh, we do alternate year to year between transport and agriculture. And this year is agriculture's turn. So uh, we're going to have welcoming remarks first from the, the Dean of Agriculture and Food to, uh, from the university. And then subsequently, uh, we have great fortune of having the Minister of Agriculture and Economic Development who will join us to bring greetings from the province. So I would just like to first invite uh, Dean Scanlon to uh, address the crowd. Uh, Dr. Martin Scanlon has uh, teaching and research interests that focus on food processing and food quality, primarily working with prairie crops. He's published over 160 peer-reviewed works, as well as another 150 non-peer-reviewed contributions. So been a very active researcher and, of course, uh, a, a very successful dean uh, at the School of Agriculture and or Faculty of Agriculture and Food. Uh, without further ado, Dr. Scanlon, thank you very much for coming and I'll, I'll turn the floor over to you. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Barry, for that nice introduction or kind introduction. Uh, welcome, Minister Eichler. We're really honored to have you here, President of the Fields and Wheel Conference. And, and welcome to every one of the delegates from wherever on the planet uh, you're coming to see this. So um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Faculty of Agricultural and Food Sciences, a faculty that gratefully acknowledges its location on the traditional Treaty 1 territory and the traditional homeland of the Métis Nation. So as Dr. Prentice mentioned, the focus of today's Fields on Wheel conferences is addressing some of the challenges that were associated with supply chains, particularly driven by some of the events that we've seen as a result of the pandemic. But we're also seeing some of these supply chains uh, blockages as a result of some of these extreme weather events. So this is a really timely topic. A lot of Canadian consumers and also consumers around the world are very concerned now about food security, something that in a lot of the developed world that we've taken for granted an, an assured, safe, nutritious and healthy food supply is no longer actually assured, not all the time. And so it's really great to see some of the topics that have been discussed at today's Fields on Wheel conference, because I think that they're, they're setting the stage for what are the things that maybe need to change in some of our supply chains 
what needs to be re re evaluated there's certainly been some calls for a greater amount of uh, local food processing to pr produce sort of resilience within local areas and so that's something that's been very fortunate to have been happening quite a lot here in the, at Manitoba and so I would like to welcome everyone to the Fields on Wheel conference. I hope that it's a very successful and interesting discussions going on because I think some of the outcomes from these discussions have very significant global ramifications in terms of food security. So welcome everyone and thank you, Barry. Welcome Minister Eichler. Thank you very much, Dean Scanlon. I appreciate you being here this morning with us. I know you have a very busy day and I appreciate you making time for us. Uh, next, I'd like to invite uh, Minister Ralph Eichler to speak. Uh, Minister Eichler is first elected to the Manitoba Legislature uh, in 2003 as a representative for Lakeside. Prior to forming government, uh, Ralph was a uh, former purebred cattle producer, so he has deep agricultural roots, and a former owner and operator of Prairie Farm and Ranch Supply, and currently owns Ray's Auction uh, Service. Aside from agriculture, Minister Eichler has had careers in business finance and education, serving as an administrator in the Lakeside School Division upon forming government in 2016. Mr. Eckler was appointed the Minister of Agriculture for the province of Manitoba. In October 2019, Mr. Eckler was appointed as the Minister of Economic Development and Training for the province of Manitoba. And in January 21, I guess they decided he didn't have enough work. They made it, doubled it up, and uh, they added uh, the economic development portfolio as well. Uh, in 2021, he was uh, Minister of Natural Resources, sorry. Uh, Minister Eichler values honesty, integrity, compassion, and community. Uh, and Minister Eichler, we know you have a, a lot of friends and a lot of respect in the community as a very uh, successful Minister of the Crown. Uh, I know that uh, it's also safe to say that uh, as assuming a role, uh, one of his central mandates has been targeting sustainable growth strategies in protein, livestock, agro-processing, and reaching the potential of our province's resources to benefit all Manitobans. And with that, Minister Eichler, thank you again for coming and the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Prentice. Uh, Dean Scallon, always good to see you even though it's uh, virtual here. And of course, to all our friends that have joined us online, it's a pleasure to join you here today to provide these welcome remarks for this 26th annual Fields on Wheels uh, conference. Uh, uh, Dr. Prentice, I know that uh, even before I was in government, I attended your conferences and what a pleasure it was and all the good work that you and your team does uh, to help move us forward. We couldn't do it without you. We know that uh, this event is all about transportation. And we know this is critical and sensitive feature for the ag sector in Manitoba, of course. Uh, as the processing sector grows, uh, Manitoba's agriculture sector continues to rely on rail and road supply chains to move products to international export markets. We are truly blessed as a province and as a country to be able to export our goods to other uh, countries and provinces in order to make us whole. Uh, there's incredible investment in Canada's green handling and transportation system by railways and green handlers, not only today, but looking forward to tomorrow. There's a similar increase in the system's ability to be able to move green. In view of this, we know governments and industry must stay focused on Canada's reputation as a reliable exporter while at the same time facing the impacts of issues like climate change. The extreme weather event just faced by British Columbia farmers reminds us just how vulnerable we are uh, in our supply chain. We all know we need to feel deep, we, I, we all know feel deep, we feel deeply for everyone affected and who are still dealing with the flooding and wish them all the best in recovery operations as they continue. 
events of nature such as rainstorms can have a domino effect. And in Manitoba, growers and exporters definitely felt the effect of lost rail and roadworks in BC. The Port of Vancouver is a significant gateway for Manitoba exporters. Rival infrastructure is critical between our Prairie Provinces and British Columbia. As we know, the abrupt interruption uh, in B was stacked on top of an already tight container supply. Access to containers is needed to serve existing customers, particular buyers of pork, specialty crops, identity preserved grains, and oil seeds to support new markets for Manitoba products. I'm happy to see that Mexico will be discussed here today as well. One of our strong North American partners. Uh, it's an important market for canola and canola products, as well as for pork. The recent CPKCS merger is a positive for Manitoba and will help our exporters reach even further into the Mexican market. In our own province, drop conditions in 2021 were extremely challenging for crop and livestock producers alike. Our government developed a suite of programs to lend support and participation from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. <clears throat> this will help ease some of the impact and the high cost of livestock feed. This also included Manitoba Agriculture Services Corporation quality adjustments on insured crops designated as alternate use for livestock feed. As well as we are providing support to producers who were forced to sell breeding stock this year with financial assistance as a restock for next year. Poor grain and oil seed production in 2021 is not only tough on farmers, it's also challenging for our industry partners, in particular for our railways, our truckers, our grain handlers. Looking ahead to 2022, we are hopeful for an improvement in terms of moisture. We have good reasons to be optimistic for strong farm incomes in the future and for crop production for which the grain handling and transportation system was built. We have excellent speakers here today and I know we'll benefit from hearing from them. On behalf of my department and the province of Manitoba, thank you to everyone here for your ideas, your dedication and contributions. I wish you all a great day and this is gonna be a good learning experience for all of us. So thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Eichler. It's a, a pleasure to have you here and we really appreciate uh, your words. Indeed, the uh, transportation system has taken a few hits and of course it rebounds back on to producers uh, both of, uh, uh, at the farm level, but also the processors and intermediaries in between. I don't think anyone would have seen the, the kind of tie-ups we had at the ports uh, six months ago or 12 months. They were just beginning to, be, to start uh, uh, to occur. And of course, uh, nobody can predict the weather uh, with any kind of certainty. So uh, it, does, it has made it a challenging year and it's, it's made it perhaps doubly challenging for a lot of producers. We certainly do feel for not just the folks who were flooded out and affected in the lower mainland of BC, but also our own producers here who had to uh, cull their hearts in order to uh, deal with a shortage of pasture and, and feed over winter. And, and of course, those who had short crops. So it is affecting everybody all the way along. Uh, as uh, Dr. Scanlon said, uh, you know, we, we used to be able to just think, well, you know, the, the agriculture always works. We're always gonna have food. Uh, we may not be able to be quite so confident of that anymore. And, and that is a, a bit of a concern, I think, that uh, is something we're going to have to deal more with. Uh, certainly uh, last year, uh, we talked about irrigation. Uh, this summer, I, I, I guess in some ways, I wish the irrigation conference were this year because we have really good reason to have uh, thinking about irrigation, but uh, that doesn't mean the problem has gone away. Uh, and I think we're going to have to be much more concerned about water resources as well as uh, we do in transportation as uh, time moves forward. Uh, thank you very much again. It's a, a real pleasure to have uh, both of you here to kick off the meeting. We do have a full agenda and uh, we, 
I guess we gain a few minutes here, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It gives us a bit few more time, a bit more time for questions uh, at the end of our sessions. And so, uh, thank you again for coming and being with us. And if you can come back in at any time, you know that's the great benefit of Zoom. You you can pop back in if there's a session you do want to see that is uh, later on in the day, and we welcome you to do that. Uh, with this, I would like now to turn the meeting over to uh, uh, Dr. Derek Bruin. Uh, who is the uh, head of the Department of Agribusiness and Agricultural Economics and our, our partner in developing uh, the fields on wheels. And he's going to chair the first session, uh, which is titled Catching Up and Going Forward. So uh, Dr. Bruin, I will now turn the floor to you. Thank you, uh, Barry, and thank you to the minister and Dean for the opening remarks. And I think uh, what the minister is worried about in terms of um, moving the crop and having a crop are, you know, it's very, very uh, comforting to hear that he's worrying about those things. I do think this was a year where lots of people were talking about COVID, but actually the, the weather and the climate was probably a bigger impact on grain transportation than anything else. Uh, but uh, where, where we were looking at uh, tight stocks and not very clogged systems, the rest of the transportation system was pretty congested and uh, I think our our speakers today are, are going to talk to that in this session. Uh, I'd like to uh, say good morning to everyone, and I want to thank you uh, uh, all for joining us on the 26th annual Fields on Wheels conference. Uh, over 300 registered. I, I remember thinking that the pool of people who cared about grain transportation was getting too small, and now I think Barry's found a great new online option to reach more people and find new and different connections to transportation for ag and the food supply chains in different ways. And I wanna congratulate you, Dr. Prentice, on 26 years of supporting the sector. And personally, I wanna thank you for expanding my own understanding of this vital part of our economy. I think I was at the first or second Fields on Wheels, which makes me, 26 years makes me a little bit uh, 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 worried, but it's okay. I, I think all that I attended were very thought provoking and thank you for that. I think we have both new folks and alumni have passed meetings in this first session of the day, and we have uh, more detailed bios of the speakers in the section on the conference website, but I will introduce our first speaker, and maybe we could start sharing P Peter Earl's uh, slides, if the, the boss there can do that. Sure. Uh, Peter is a, a, an economist who joined the American Institute of Economic Research in 2018. Prior to that, he spent over 20 years as a trader and analyst at a number of securities firms and hedge funds in the New York area. His research focuses on financial markets, cryptocurrencies, monetary policy related issues, and the, the economics of games and problems in economic measurement. Pete holds an MA in applied economics from the American University, as well as an MBA and an engineering degree from the United States Military Academy at West Point. And now I will let you take over the screen, Pete. So thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to be here. When I was originally asked about this event, uh, I, I commented to both Barry and to one of my colleagues, that I was really disappointed that I wouldn't be traveling to Manitoba. And one of, my, uh, one of my coworkers asked me when this event was, and I said, December 14th. And he said, that shows how much you know. So uh, <laughs> perhaps another time. But anyway, uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, so yeah, my name is Pete Earle. Um, I'm, uh, I'm an economist at the American Institute for Economic Research in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. In early October 2021, uh, I wrote an article entitled An Armor Conspired the Global Shipping Freeze, in which I attempted to chronicle the root causes and provide a timeline for the growing shipping delays. The words uh, an armor conspired made reference to a poem by Jim Morrison entitled Horse Latitudes, in which he alludes to times and places where the sullen sea conspires in armor. Um, uh, that's the horse latitudes, of course, uh, where mariners would at times be forced to throw nearly everything overboard in order to lighten their craft and catch the faintest breezes in their sails to escape the doldrums. So I'm gonna start my talk here. Um, this to me is a really a miracle and a wonder of the modern world. Uh, this is a somewhat obscure index captured by the US Census Bureau and it's entitled the Manufacturing and Trade Inventory to Sales Ratio for Total Business. 
somewhat ungainly title, I, I agree. But um, and that's all it is really. It's a ratio of the total final inventory that firms keep on hand divided by their total sales. And what's remarkable to me about this graph is its extraordinary balance and consistency over time. Now, now yes, it employs mathematical averages, but despite changes in consumer preference and taste, a, a constant avalanche of new and improved goods arriving in the marketplace, and ceaseless technological innovation, firms of various sizes with heterogeneous entrepreneurial talents and various financial and physical capital, by and large, stock their inventory to match sales with extraordinary efficiency. Over a longer time frame, this graph reveals two other things. First, that there was a long period in which there was a downward trend in evidence, which shows less and less inventory held in anticipation of sales. And that really represents the growing uh, power and sophistication of inventory management tools, big data, and all that. And second, that during recessions, the ratio is thrown completely askew. It spikes up as consumers either can't or choose not to purchase goods, and then slowly falls back to normal levels, indicating the return of normal conditions. But even beyond this, I think there's a vastly more important takeaway from this obscure data and chart. And that's that hundreds of thousands of firms run by private actors with various levels of expertise and experience, focusing on a wide spectrum of goods and services are able to match changing demand and supply extraordinarily well, in, and, and as well seasonality, without a ministry of stuff running by a satisfaction czar issuing edicts. So, the price system, as we know, transmits local information in forms of scarcity or, or surplus, and over time rewards those that plan the best. So, as I mentioned, my article, the purpose of my article, which came out in early October, was to outline the major causative factors, which in early October led to hundreds of ships floating off of major ports, most notably in California, off the coast of Long Beach and Los Angeles, but waiting to dock and unload their cargo. And those numbers are made all the more staggering when compared to the average number of ships in ordinary times waiting at ports. The average at those ports is zero to one. Most of that cargo is in the form of intermodal shipping containers, which in my opinion is another miracle of the modern world. But the causality as I outlined it traces as follows. And this is the first item here. I have rigidities for decades. For decades, ports in the US have operated on the basis of some of the shortest daily operating hours in the world and usually with outdated technology. That tends to be a function of, of, of powerful long-term collective bargaining agreements and ports being government agencies, whereas most other ports in the world operate 24 seven with automated and uh, computerized equipment. And so this is where we really get started. And so in March, 2020, the initial response to the COVID-19 pandemic was made with a combination of lockdowns, stay-at-home orders, social distancing, and a host of other interventions, which we call NPIs, non-pharmaceutical interventions. Needless to say, inventory skyrocketed, and that's depicted like this on this graph. Shortly thereafter, though, there was a two-punch combination of economic policy responses. We had a massive internationally coordinated raft of expansionary monetary policy procedure, uh, measures and a huge multi-stage fiscal stimulus program in the US. And this explosion of liquidity with hundreds of millions of people in the world stuck at home resulted in a nuclear blast of consumption activity. It's important to note that owing to the nature of lockdowns, this was almost entirely goods rather than service-based uh, discretionary spending binge. And now this is what came next. The impact is seen here. Inventories rapidly being drawn off of shelves away from warehouses and other storage facilities. And in fact, the very beginnings of difficulty keeping up with demand, as you see that as the, as the number, as the data comes back down, it's actually lower initially than the initial uh, average of about 1.35, 1.37. So the first shock, the first major shock in March of 2021 comes in the form of the lodging of the massive ever given container ship in the Suez Canal. When that occurred, you had 12% of global shipborne trade held up for six days, ultimately 500 ships delayed from reaching their destinations and countless others replotting their routes, usually to a longer, uh, a longer route, either around uh, the Horn of Africa or, 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 or that sort of thing. And next, this is an area I covered uh, in detail. Um, 
having to do with the pandemic policy effects of lumber markets where owing to mill closures in both the US and Canada and simultaneously a massive urge of interest in home development projects, lumber prices went from a, a multi-decade average of between $300 and $600 per thousand board feet to almost $1,700 per thousand board feet. And the way this impacts shipping is that pallets, which are required in shipping containers, were suddenly in short supply and the wood made, made to, to, to create um, uh, replacement pallets were bid away from the market by home builders and do-it-yourselfers. Next, we have in late May, 2021, the Chinese port known as Yantian closed owing to a new COVID outbreak. This is the arrival of the Delta variant. And um, it's a port that usually handles about 30,000 20 foot containers a day. And this sent the Shanghai to Rotterdam rates of shipping up 500%, such that rates, which usually cost between $1,500 and $2,000 per container, suddenly topped $10,000 per container for the very first time. A few months later, I, and I, at the time, I thought this was probably the quintessential or zenith moment in all of this. Um, uh, uh, the Chinese port at Ningbao Zoshan's closed. It's, a, it's an absolutely massive port, but the reason for its closure is even more emblematic or seemed like it in my view. Um, a lone 34 year old male worker who was described as asymptomatic tested positive for COVID. And this is the point at which the fragility of many coasts, of many ports, in particular US West Point coach was, ports was exposed. So with a much, suddenly with a much larger proportion of available shipping containers floating, rather than being taken onto ports by, and picked up by sweeper ships, and with the notably fewer containers available, unable to be filled with pallets, prices of containers and routes took another leg up, which brings us here, back to our manufacturing trade inventory to sales ratio. Remembering that inventories are in the numerator and sales in the denominator, it's logical that during a recession or an artificial depression, such as the non-pharmaceutical interventions brought on, the value of the ratio would shoot up as inventories grow and sales fall, and then they normalize. But what has rarely been seen happen in, over the history of this index happened next. Inventories shrank as sales stayed the same or grew, and that's seen in the value of the ratio falling below 1.35 which was the average for many, many years. And I finished that original article uh, by summarizing the state of affairs in this way. There's an unavoidable price for the ceaseless avalanche of goods and services falling around us. And that price is exposure to an errant inherent level of complexity. Only the coordination of a superabundant array of prices, timing, capacity, and information keeps the globally integrated supply chain functioning. A single misstep or error increases the likelihood of subsequent problems at every juncture in the process. Science and engineering have brought about an era in which doldrums no longer vex modern day mariners. There are no modern horse latitudes where payloads are dumped overboard, but those conditions have reemerged. The idea that an economy could be indiscriminately shut down and turned back on without far reaching consequence as if a light switch or a lawnmower is damnable. And with that, I'd like to now turn towards updates to a lot of what was in that original article. So in terms of shipping rates, when the original article was published in early October, it cost $7,961 to ship a container from the Hong Kong area to Los Angeles as per the Drury benchmark rate. As of yesterday, the rate was $7,937. So it's changed by less than $30 in, in the previous two and a half months. With respect to containers and per the CTS global average container price index, the measure was 126.86 in early October and it's now 144.65. That's an increase of 14%. Lumber, as I mentioned, used in pallets had fallen from a five or more decade high, uh, high of 1,700 per thousand board feet to below $500 per thousand board feet. It has now risen back again to over $1,000 per thousand board feet. And by the way, these are front month contract prices, which are the most liquid contract prices in the futures markets. Now, yet despite that, those factor prices and indices being the same or higher than they were in October, there are reports that congestion uh, along the East Coast is easing. And those accounts, I can tell you, are true in a certifiable or existential way. But in fact, the ships, the number of ships waiting to dock was roughly 80 in November. It's now closer to 100. What has changed is the method of counting ships. The standard measure was to count all inbound ships, which were within 40 miles of the port. 
In mid-November, the procedure was adjusted to keep a certain number of ships outside the 40 mile zone, assigning them a calculated time of arrival, not when they arrive, but when they leave the prior port. Thus, there are indeed more shipping delays, but they are being counted differently administratively. So it would be more accurate at this point in time to say that there's been little improvement, but the circumstances have sort of spread out into the broader shipping and transportation ecosystem. Oh, uh, let me go back, okay. With respect to those containers which have made it off of the ships, drainage truckers, that's uh, truckers at ports, are reporting flawed appointment systems, long waits, and other inefficiencies. The shipping crisis has now additionally exposed a deep chasm in highway transportation. While, long, while large trucking firms tend to engage in long-term contracts with industrial manufacturing concerns, small trucking concerns and owner-operated trucks ply their wares in the overland spot market, a critical if little no market where everything from one-off shipping jobs to irregular freight to last minute changes, for example, switching from rail to truck take place. The lockdowns, stay-at-home orders and other non-pharmaceutical interventions last year inflicted an extinction level event on small trucking interests with over 3,100 filing for bankruptcy and 88,000 truckers losing their jobs in April of 2020 alone. That amid rising gas prices, higher insurance premium and so on, brought freight, freight rates over 30, up over 36% last year. So I wanna add, as we're almost closer, approaching the end of this uh, talk, that I'm very concerned about the US administration's seeming insistence on hindering, if not outright stopping, $455 billion of US-Canada trade that passes borders in uh, mid-January. And actually, I didn't know this was going to be today, but I have an article on the on the shipping aspect of the crisis that was actually published on the AIR site at 9 a.m. this morning. So there's a handful of takeaways here, and they're mostly obvious. The first is that the consequences of a false dichotomy that policymakers had to select between public health or functional economies are not only still around 20 months later, but they're in some cases worse than that. The second is that as economists in our roles, as educators and public intellectuals, we need to do a much better job, I think, conveying and emphasizing organic rather than mechanistic concept of how economies work, more like a coordinated, globally dispersed ballet recital than a system of hydraulics or pulleys. And finally, the closest I can find to a silver lining at, the, at this point is many of the ossified corners and dark underbellies of our economies have been exposed for the first time. They make good studies, and good, good case studies, but they serve as better as, as, as calls to action. Now and not when the Phi, uh, Pi, Rose, Sigma, or Tau variant come along is the time for social scientists to advise, ameliorating and improving the snags where and when we can. And that concludes my talk. Uh, happy to hear, uh, you know, to, to take your questions, whatever afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pete. That was very interesting. And uh, totally agree as an economist, it's been very difficult to have much impact on policy, even when you make really good points. So just, just a warning to the young economists, I'm sure you suffered through that yourself. Uh, so now we can uh, move on to our, uh, yes, I got a question for Barry. Are, are we gonna be able to share the slides? Or the speakers, I guess. Uh, I'm happy to share my slides. Okay, maybe we'll ask, you to contact them if you need the slides. Barry, are you going to be able to? I think in some cases uh, people are not, but I think in general the cases yes. And we'll post them on the website. Uh, the the plan is to have a, a transcript of this available uh, on the website. It's just being recorded, so it won't be immediate, but eventually yes, it will be there. Okay, thank you very much for the, the housekeeping there. So now we can pass the. Uh, the torch over to um, Doug Mills. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. I, I, do you mind? I'll give you a quick intro if that's all right. Great. We will hold questions till the end for the whole panel, uh, but our second speaker is Doug Mills, the senior account rep for the bulk and break bulk cargo sectors at the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority. He's got more than 30 years of experience working in the Marine Air Road and rail modes of transportation. So right in the root of uh, some of the problems Pete was just talking about. His portfolio includes coal, potash, sulfur grain, forest products, automobiles, liquid bulk. 
Doug has a bachelor's degree in business from Simon Fraser University and a diploma in marketing and transportation distribution uh, management from the British Columbia Institute of Technology. Excellent. Can you, I'm just wondering, can yes. you see the screen with the full screen or are you seeing the partial screen? We can see the full screen. Excellent. That, in in Excellent. your own software, it might be uh, just a uh, hit the full view or something. Yeah, no problem. It's just that I have two screens and once in a while okay. they flip on me. So That's thank great. you very much Sorry. for that intro. And uh, good to see some faces I haven't seen in a couple of years since our last gathering. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak with you all today. Um, again, my name is Doug Mills with the Port of Vancouver. Uh, my prime role here is just in um, our engagement uh, as an authority with uh, our major customers, shippers, uh, shipping lines, and uh, international delegations. Uh, so what will we be talking about today? Um, I think it's important to first capture the foundation of what we do and why we do it. So I'm going to quickly go through our mission mission mandate. We'll talk about the government's uh, the jurisdiction that we cover within the gateway. Uh, we'll describe the gateway as we see it currently. Um, we'll also quickly review the trade cargo volumes because I think that tells a very interesting story. <clears throat> we'll uh, talk about how work that's been going on now uh, and actually for probably the last 12 years has impacted what we're seeing as the recovery in many of the sectors. So we'll investigate that. Um, we'll also talk about operational updates because we're not just talking about COVID here. We're talking about a series of unprecedented interruptions uh, and uh, in a series almost of biblical proportions, I say, because I can almost read those in, in texts. But uh, port optimization and digitization is the other piece that is beyond the infrastructure that is really talking about how we measure and understand what is occurring uh, in real time basis. And as well as another important feature due to our mandate, which is environmental programs. So let's begin. Uh, so the Port Authority, uh, we're, we're an arm's length federal agency, really. What does that mean? Uh, we're unique in that uh, we don't use any tax dollars to operate our port. We have actually a, a lot of autonomy in decision making and lending and borrowing, et cetera. Um, and, and in doing that gives us an ability to be very nimble and, and to also project in the future uh, what we need as a gateway as opposed to waiting for government to give approvals. Um, our goal, our mission is to be the most sustainable port in the world, uh, but we do that with the pillars and understanding of uh, thriving communities, uh, understanding what they need and how we impact them, um, economic prosperity through trade, obviously why we're here to support uh, Canada's national economy and the customers that are using the port. And also the environment, because we sit in an urban environment and we have a lot of eyes on us. And in order to grow, you have to do it in a sustainable manner that shows that you're responsible. Uh, we lease federal lands to terminals, so we don't operate terminals. On, uh, I, I guess quite uh, contrary to what a lot of people believe. Um, we review projects, meaning we actually are the initiators of permits for building on that property in the port. We also build infrastructure. We oversee environmental programs uh, that we'll get into some of those. And uh, we work closely with communities to ensure that there's an understanding of why the port exists in their, in their neighborhoods. And we have 16 of them uh, in our local jurisdiction, which means 16 mayors, 16 councils, all with their own ideas about how to spend tax dollars and how land should be used. So we, we have a constant conversation about that. Our board of directors is uh, a, a broad perspective. Uh, we have seven that are federally appointed based on recommendations from industry. Um, and they meet regularly to decide who will be filling board positions, those board positions as they become available. Federal government appoints, appoints one, the British Columbia government has an appointee and the western provinces of Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta have an appointee of which some of you may be familiar with the current uh, member sitting is Brant Randalls that came from industry as well as there is one appointee that represents the 16 municipalities within the port jurisdiction. Um, so 
we're, as I mentioned, we're the federal agency that stewards the Port of Vancouver. Um, our, our mandate to facilitate trade, but while ensuring safety, environmental protection, consideration for community, communities, uh, it is a complex jurisdiction. That map in the upper right uh, area shows the, the jurisdiction that falls under our responsibility. All of the red indicates the foreshore or the lands that come under our jurisdiction. The dark blue are the waterways. Um, just to give you a perspective, if you were to get in a car and go from the northernmost point of our jurisdiction and drive to the southernmost, uh, without traffic, it'd probably take you over 40 minutes. With traffic, you'd be lucky if it's an hour. So uh, it is very expansive and uh, has all the complexities of the, the jurisdictions of the municipalities within that. Also intersects traditional uh, territories of several uh, first treaties of First Nations. And uh, with that, uh, we also engage and uh, keep a, um, close contact and close discussion with what we are doing within those, uh, within those concerns. Some interesting perspectives for those are, who are not familiar, but 77% of the total tonnage traded uh, is to Asia from Port of Vancouver, to and from. Um, and if you look specifically at containers, that's over 93%. So you can see how this, uh, this last series of trade issues uh, had particular influence in this region or could have. And, and there's somewhat of a good news story here too that I'm gonna get into. So we are Canada's largest port authority. Uh, in context, that's the size of the next five ports in Canada combined. It's larger than that. Uh, it supports 115,000 jobs across Canada. Um, and unlike most ports across North America, we've sustained growth for at least the last decade. Uh, it has been quite phenomenal in terms of the, the real demand that we've been seeing. And uh, resilience. Um, the diversity of cargo, I think, has been a part of the success of the port's growth. Um, we have probably the most diverse line of products, supply chains, coming through this region than almost any other port in North America. Uh, if we look at how that's made up, we have five business sectors. Uh, bulk, which would include grain, potash, coal, um, fertilizers all of the con uh, products contained in containers, break bulk, which would include our forest products, steel project cargoes, obviously automobiles and our cruise sectors. So supply chain, um, uh, distribution, what did that look like? The pandemic we believe has stress tested the Canadian gateway of Vancouver, um, including the supply chains to the East and West. Um, what do we mean by that? Well. The investments that we were making to keep our growth uh, attuned with the demand that we were talking about has in some ways allowed us to, to, to get over in some supply chains uh, the impacts that could have been through uh, all of these disruptions that we've seen. I'll get into that in a minute as well. We've seen uh, manufacturing port shutdowns in Asia, as we just heard about, and the impacts it had direct impacts on cargoes coming through Vancouver. Uh, pandemic impacts on autos as autos were shut down and production stopped. And then even now uh, they're muted as uh, due to the microchip shortage worldwide, we're not seeing the, the volumes that we would normally see. Uh, the, of course, the cruise season was canceled for two years in a row. Uh, substantial impacts to the local economy in particular, uh, as well as revenue sectors that we would normally see in the port's operations. Um, and all of the above have resulted in significant shipping backlogs. Um, we can point to uh, the Anchorage uh, as an example. We can port, uh, point to cargoes that are not making it to store shelves or even missed opportunities in terms of marketing our products overseas. But we'll, uh, we'll go into those. Um, despite all of the impacts, all the events that we've seen, we've actually seen increased volumes despite COVID. Now I'm going to give an exception and that is up until probably October, most of our numbers were looking very positive. And, and that 
it's attributed to, I guess, diversity and, and the fact that uh, many of our uh, advancements in building capacity could take up and create buffers for some of the backlogs that we were seeing. Total volumes are still expected to increase in the coming years. As we see rebuilds around the world, uh, we're seeing the need for the natural resources that come from this region. So uh, many of those high volume sectors uh, are uh, uh, showing us trade volumes increasing in the future. Here's just some examples. I'm sorry, these are a little confusing in the way they came out, but the first two bars you see in each of these product categories are actually a comparative of 2019 to 2020. And we did, for example, see a dip in coal. But the second two bars, the two, the dark and light gray, you're showing the year to date October, which showed a significant uptick in the volumes uh, that were occurring up until that point. Similarly, uh, with grain uh, volumes, the 2020 volumes uh, were, were uh, more than the 2019. However, again, up until uh, the end of November, uh, we, sorry, October, I should say, uh, we were seeing some relatively uh, good responses, although one would have to understand also we were coming toward the end of the grain shipping season, but also the real events in November when supply chain uh, through the valley, uh, our, uh, the Fraser Valley in particular, was completely cut off. So these uh, will have uh, responded quite differently. On the container side, much more dramatic in that uh, there were a series of events that were described by the previous uh, speaker. Um, again, the year over year 2019, 2020, yeah, we were starting to see impacts of uh, uh, less volumes in part because of those demand shifts of production uh, and impacts of COVID, et cetera. Uh, similarly with uh, containerized grain, but uh, what we are seeing in the 2021 year to date July, that's the latest data we have currently that's been validated because some supplies streams of data have been uh, cut or, or not up to date, but the impacts are much more severe. And that is in due to the current container imbalance that we're seeing globally. And uh, we are seeing those impacts here as well. Um, although in some cases, uh, we may be riding that way just a little better, but nevertheless, um, and, and as shippers will tell you, and I'm sure Steve and Paul will, uh, particularly on the export containerized traffic, significant impacts. Overall, uh, our total forecast growth um, is very strong. Um, we see the impacts here from 2020 and 2021. Uh, you see the complete lack of cruise activity. We see dips in particularly the auto market. And, and uh, although the overall, again, trend is uh, that of growth. And again, uh, capacity within the port to absorb some of these uh, issues and again, I'm going to caveat that up until the end of October, um, we're show a resiliency. And um, so to that extent, um, I think what we're looking at is rationale for continuing to do what we've been doing in terms of uh, focusing on future growth now instead of waiting. This is a very interesting slide that's popped up and one that particularly focuses on the export issue of containers. Uh, this has never happened in the history of the port. What you're seeing here, the yellow, is the uh, full container export volumes in TEUs and the bottom is the uh, empty export volumes and in fact what you're seeing is an increase in the number of empties that are being exported out of the gateway as compared to the number of fulls. And this is a dynamic that I'm sure many of you are aware of in that due to these imbalances in trade and this what we call bullwhip effect of uh, production stoppages, the increase in demand, the attempts to supply these huge demand growths, um, as well as the, the variability of the, uh, the supply chain in general, um, the rates for moving containers have particularly on the eastbound leg skyrocketed. And what it has done is it's created an impetus for carriers to want empties back into Asia as quickly as possible in order to take, to take advantage of what I would call record 
rates for movement of empty of full containers. And just as a comparative, and, and I'm going to take some examples that I know of uh, what were uh, moving um, previous to COVID and these events. Um, on the eastbound leg for a container uh, was, let's just, we're going to use a, a rough figure for a given commodity of, let's say, $2,000 to move a full container from Asia into the gateway. And in cases where we're getting reports of that same container bidding on values in excess of $20,000. So for those reasons, uh, carriers are wanting to capitalize on what they see. Oops, sorry. I ahead there uh, on on what they see is an opportunity to make up for years of running uh, in the red and uh, being able to capitalize on on, on uh, the ability to make make back and or one would argue maybe make more back than uh, what they had lost in the past but this is on the back of the opportunity to move full containers of car Canadian cargo so right here, in uh, this is right around, I can't see the bottom of my screen here, but I believe it's right around September. We saw the first time ever that there are more empties being exported out of the gateway than fulls. That's not a good thing. And um, we've brought, drawn this uh, to the attention uh, of everybody in that, uh, yeah, unique and uh, something that uh, very much describes uh, one of the impacts of COVID and supply chain disruption in this region. So supporting recovery, um, first off, we are, one of our jobs I mentioned is to build infrastructure. We've been focusing on this, I would say for over a dozen years, once we recognized the impact of the Asian trade in its growth um, and how that may have created resiliency for us in a number of sectors to maintain that growth rate. We're continuing to, to do that. We're continuing to look out into the future and we we're continuing to show that it needs to be paid attention to by government, by industry, by our supply chain partners to support jobs, sustains local companies and brings investment in the region. That is a focus for the region to want to have this activity occur. Several benefits the result uh, to our communities, and, and part of which is a role of this organization, is to educate those communities as to why a port is beneficial in their backyard and why this activity is necessary, not just for Canada, but for them directly. And these are some of those examples. Uh, these are examples of the of the areas of, of investment that are occurring within the region. Um, those are tranches of projects that are currently on, on uh, our planning books and or our uh, shovels to the ground. They include uh, projects much like this, which is the uh, basically the a series of projects meant to increase the efficiency and the fluidity of cargo into the North Shore, which would support all of the, well, the grain facilities, the, the coal, the potash facilities on North Shore of Vancouver. What this represents is a bottleneck that current, uh, previously existed. It allows for an expansion of rail trackage for longer trains to run more frequently through the uh, through the second Neuros tunnel, uh, the CN second Neuros tunnel, where there also are planned improvements and um, to maximize the opportunity of moving cargo to those expanding uh, terminals on the North Shore. But it also represents benefits to the local community by uh, de-bottlenecking local traffic, which is, this is a very congested area and allows that community to also benefit and come on board in supporting this project as an important uh, piece of infrastructure that needs to be paid attention to. So projects that are currently on the books are over a billion dollars. Uh, they range in uh, value uh, up to $150 million in a project bundle um, and generally involves uh, construction of road, roadway overpasses that de-bottleneck the rail infrastructure from the road infrastructure. Additionally, container expansion is, is paramount. Uh, we recognize that the port without the development of these projects will have already run out of container supply, uh, at least in being able to handle containers. Uh, the center expansion was meant to address uh, part of that uh, 
demand issue. And the, the other major project that is on focus for us, obviously, is the Roberts Bank Terminal 2 project, which will bring on 2.4 million TEUs of capacity. Uh, none, that is the only serious project that it will uh, provide the necessary capacity needed to continue Canada's export and import trade growth via container uh, without running out of capacity in the next 15 to 20 years. There are no other projects in the hopper that will come on stream in order to meet that timeline. The Centrum expansion project, by the way, will bring us that terminal from about 900,000 TEUs to 1.5 million TEUs and is uh, scheduled for the end of 2022 opening. So supply chain disruptions that we've seen, as I mentioned, they've been a series. And we started with the BC heat dome in which we had unprecedented temperatures. My back deck was 42 degrees. It's never happened in the lower mainland before. Uh, you, you can read about the impacts of that, including uh, the Linton fires uh, that then took out the, the, uh, uh, the, the rail lines, the major uh, rail lines in and out of the Port of Vancouver, and then followed up almost uh, right after that by the floods. Um, as a result of all these, there is a central body of folks that are looking at restoration. It includes a makeup of federal and, and provincial governments uh, through the Joint Federal Provincial Supply Chain Recovery, Recovery Working Group. That includes uh, federal and provincial agencies, as well as the railways and industrial associations. And I just want to take this second to recognize the work of the railways, um, the, the efforts that have been applied to reopening the supply chains, our rail supply chains, and even our road have to recognize the provincial government and, and their efforts as well is phenomenal. Uh, hats off. I think everybody is uh, applauding uh, the 24-hour, uh, seven-day-a-week effort and the literally thousands of tons of earth that is being moved to make it happen. And uh, even on our road networks, the provincial government now announced today that they believe they will be able to reconnect uh, the highway systems, uh, particularly the Coquihalla, as early as early January, which is, if you saw the pictures, is phenomenal. Uh, so hats off to everybody that is working collectively and coming together to, to make things happen to uh, address these. Um, port optimization and, and digitization, you're going to hear a lot more about this. Uh, funding, uh, funded projects are going to move forward. It's not just about building bricks and mortar infrastructure. It's about building um, the, the, the uh, digitization and the being able to monitor and measure the activity in real time so that decisions can be made in real time so that that infrastructure, that bricks and mortar infrastructure is used to its most efficient means. And, and that does two things. It allows us to maximize capabilities of what we have, but it also proves out the need for investment in the future and where exactly it needs to go because we'll have hard data to measure it. Examples of those planning projects include the supply chain visibility project, which means bringing together disparate supply chains so that we have a global view of what is occurring in the gateway, short scene shipping initiatives to take necessary cargo off of the roadways and rail where it can be handled, for example, through interwaterways such as barges, anchorage management and utilization so that we maximize the efficient uh, use of of anchorages as more ships come into this region. We need to be sure that uh, the, the need for the anchorage and the, the gen genuine use of the anchorage is legitimate and is used to its maximum potential and where it is so it does not impact local communities as much as it has been, as well as a new project called active vessel management, which is now just being rolled out. It will prioritize the movement of vessels within the harbor to ensure again that we are prioritizing those movements that are most essential and creating rationale for when uh, vessels move between critical pinch points. Um, I mentioned environmental programs. Why is this important? Well, it gives us the mandate uh, within our stewardship to ensure we can continue to grow the gateway despite being in a fishbowl, <laughs> virtually we are, we're in a, in a 
urban region in which everybody's concerned about their backyard. So we have to grow things in a way that is showing we are responsible and that we have the confidence to continue to grow uh, in, the, in the ways that Canada needs us to. They include projects that involve admissions management, uh, examples of short those are shore power in which we're plugging in uh, cruise vessels and container vessels so they can completely shut off their engines. Uh, ECHO program, which recognizes the habitat which we use, uh, including the southern resident killer whales that are having uh, showing some strains on, on that pod. Uh, we are uh, undergoing efforts to be able to relieve the stresses that are occurring on those pods, such as slowing down of vessels and reducing noise so that they can hunt. ECHO action, which includes um, providing incentives to ships who use alternate fuels or uh, alternate means of propulsion so that they minimize their uh, uh, their noise, their their imprint, and, and as well as their, uh, their emissions footprint. And then habitat enhancement. So when we build something, we give back to the habitat to recover what was lost and then some. And we every project will have a habitat bank set aside where natural habitat has been either reproduced and or replaced in order to ensure that we're not uh, negatively impacting uh, from the growth that we see. So in closing remarks, um, as the pandemic has been persevered, we've seen surging consumer spending driving up demand for imports. We heard that previously too, um, and it's overwhelmed trans-Pacific trade lanes. Um, I didn't say this earlier, but I would say of the trade lanes on the West Coast that were impacted, we actually have come through this a little better than others. And uh, the numbers prove that, uh, the exception being the export container trade, which I mentioned. I should say the import container trade as well, obviously, because of the uh, uh, just overall uh, disruption in global markets and global supply chains. Um, in 2020, uh, we, we mentioned we did grow slightly, uh, new record set for grain potash and containers. Grain will not necessarily repeat that in 2021 for a number of reasons, including those big disruptions that we saw, but also just the, the crop year. Uh, the takeaway from the port authority, given our role overseeing long-term planning for the port, is actually seeing port resilience and strength. And we believe with the potential for future events such as this, the program of investing into port capacity is proven to be effective in mitigating what could have been much worse circumstances. So we're promoting a focus of continuing to see growth that is necessary for Canada's largest gateway. Um, yeah, it's put us in a very competitive position for the West Coast. Um, uh, that, that not saying much in the current condition because everybody is hurting it. it the current time, uh, but again, it, as a comparative, um, we were, we're looking better than we could have, and uh, we will continue to focus on those efforts moving forward. So thank you for your time, and I'll look forward to your questions later. Thank, thank you, Doug. Uh, um, I'll uh, get moving right away to, so we get, get closer to on, on time here. Uh, our last speaker uh, in the opening session, Stephen Paul. He's the Vice President and Chief Operations Officer at uh, Raymount Logistics. And maybe we can start sharing if he needs to share the screen and then we can get that started now. Uh, Raymount offers uh, logistics solutions for clients in the agriculture sector with terminals in, uh, and offices in Montreal, Vancouver, Prince Rupert, and Spokane, Washington. Stephen started his career in logistics in 1999. Uh, so he was a little late to come to the first Fields on Wheels. Uh, the, the, with nearly two decades in areas specific to agricultural products, he uh, brings a unique set of knowledge and training and perspectives in uh, resourcing early uh, in his career. He, uh, he helped set up the Winnipeg branch dedicated to agricultural exports. Uh, and throughout his nearly 10 years at Raymont Logistics, he was focused on operation and execution flow of their business from origin to destination. So thank you, Stephen, for coming. And that screen is yours. All right, thank you for the introduction. And yeah, although I did miss the first Fields on Wheels conference, I remember telling someone a couple of days ago, I did a presentation back in 
2003 or four. <laughs> And I completely bombed that one. It was my first public speaking engagement. And I think it was one of the most traumatic experiences of my professional career. So hopefully this one goes better. Um, so I had the pleasure of speaking two years ago. So part of what I'm going to be doing today in the presentation is kind of giving a, kind of a retrospective. We've heard some things on stuff. What, what, what has happened over the last two years and kind of where we're going forward. Uh, before we get to that, um, just a bit about the the company as a whole and our origins. Uh, for those who are not familiar with who Raymont Logistics is, uh, we started off as a transiting, uh, sorry, as a trucking company back in 1992. We later went into uh, transiting in 94. And then as we continued to grow and develop and expand in different locations, we got into the logistics uh, environment as well. Uh, we have continued growth over the years. Uh, we've been uh, expanding into the United States. Uh, with new terminals over the course of the last two years and also going into different commodities. Why that's important and why I would put that into context is because everything that we do is an integrated logistics model. So I'm not only going to be speaking from a uh, like a logistics perspective, but also from a transloading perspective, because everything that we do is combined into one. Um, so that gives us a unique perspective to kind of see from the ground perspective what's happening at different levels of the supply chain to kind of give us a focus as we kind of go forward. So uh, our current locations that we have, we have five in North America right now and another one uh, scheduled for next year. Uh, we have one, Montreal was our founding location back in uh, 90, 1994 from Transloading. And then we opened Vancouver uh, in 2008, Prince Rupert in 2017, uh, Seattle in 2020, Charleston in 2021. And we've got a Mobile, Alabama facility scheduled for 2022. Um, I'm going to be talking specifically to the Canadian terminals in this presentation. Again, going to kind of that past, present, and future uh, side of things. So I'm going to start off with Prince Rupert. Uh, you know, if I go back to 2019, this was a Unitrain only facility. Uh, we ran 24 7 operations. Um, we, and we were doing a peak volume of about 3,000 containers per month, all agricultural goods. So it was really you know, uniquely focused on a very specific set of commodities, doing unit trains of canola meal pellets, wheat, and pulses. Um, you know, the specific challenges at that time were it was 100% rail dependency for, for both cargo and empty containers. And there was always a high demand of, of volume moving through this corridor during peak seasons. At times there was more unit train demand to move through than the facility could happen. Um, and then also with that in mind, it was also trying to coordinate those unit trains and those empties. If you flash forward to the current situation now in 2021, uh, it's completely changed. Uh, and a lot of this has to do with the fact of the crop season that we've had in place and also the different supply chain uh, factors that have come into play. Uh, although we still do unit train cargo, uh, given the poor crop this year, it's we, you know where we would see five to six unit trains per month. We may now see one. Uh, we do a lot more manifest rail traffic, and you know instead of a 24/7 operation, we really have to adjust our staffing based on the volumes. Um, the current production is a bit higher than it was a couple of years ago. Uh, this is largely due to other commodities. And I'm going to put this into focus because it really, as from a grain perspective, it really kind of paints a picture as to where things are going right now and where some challenges might lie in the future. Um, our primary business, as it currently stands, given um, where the demand from the grain sector comes from, is, is on the plastic resin side of things and also on forest products. Uh, forest products is a newer development. And that's in large part to some of the um, unfortunate events that have occurred cutting off the, the lower mainland over the last couple of months. Um, where the challenges lie today in this corridor, again, is the inconsistency of the traffic and trying to staff. It's a very small facility. So when you know customers do want to move unit trains and those things aren't consistent, you know, we've got to try to juggle that and try to find a way to, you know, to motivate staff to come in when is when it's needed. Um, to keep that level of consistency there. Um, and then also co coordinating with new commodities, as I kind of alluded to above. Um, this facility here has about 200 cars of track capacity. Uh, previously, we would just stack it up with two unit trains and 
unload on a 24 seven basis. And now we're trying to coordinate different size of containers, different commodity movements. Um, and it's really, you know, it's really been a challenge to try to juggle that because you know, traditionally this quarter doesn't have it, but we're the biggest impact this year. And that's a byproduct of, of things that uh, Peter spoke about and Doug have spoke about is the high freight rates versus bulk vessels. So as imports have increased significantly, and we've we heard some examples that Doug mentioned previously, uh, freight rates have also increased on the export side as well. And so this has created a, a tremendous challenge of when you're trying to you know, convince customers to move cargo in containers in large quantities such as unit trains, when they start comparing it to bulk vessels, two years ago, it was comparable. Uh, you know, in this current environment, it's much more difficult to try to get those, those container economics to work. And with steamship lines, we're mainly focused on moving empties back uh, to Asia uh, versus loaded containers, it's even becoming more of a challenge. So where does this leave us moving forward? Um, you know, the biggest question we, we ask ourselves internally here is, will container rates normalize? Uh, you know, I wish we had a crystal ball to say which direction things will go. Uh, I unfortunately do not. Um, you know, my personal opinion is some of the import push and demand may not subside until at least summer of 2023. You know, from our vantage point here, we're preparing for at least another 18 months of difficulties um, on the on the supply chain side and that push pull effect. Um, you know. The other challenges ahead is what will 2022 look like? Uh, you know, we hope that the crop is a, is a better outlook for the upcoming year. Um, but, you know, and as we kind of look forward, there's different facilities coming online in Western Canada. There's gonna be more production of different types of agricultural pr products, um, specifically on the canola and crushing side and some of the meal, meal pellet byproducts that come from that. So as we also look from a challenging perspective in, in you know, the upcoming year and the years to come is how do we balance everything, right? With, you know, diverse, you know, we, as we see customers kind of diversifying their supply chains and looking to go to multiple locations, you know, to kind of balance things out because, you know, two years, for example, two years ago in Prince Rupert, there were blockades and nothing could go in that quarter. Now there's weather events in Vancouver that are blocking it. So now we're starting to see a, a trend from customers that say, okay, well, maybe I do need both, right? Just as a, so as new volumes continue to do it with a limited footprint, how do we kind of manage that? Uh, we do have an expansion project that is tabled. It is the Ridley Island Export Logistics Park. Uh, it's a joint, uh, it's a joint project between CN DP World, the Port of Prince Rupert and ourselves. Uh, this will allow us to kind of take this footprint that we see here in Prince Rupert and move it to a larger scale, which we help will help offset kind of that any in future demand and, and balancing multiple commodities at the same time. Uh, the Vancouver side of things, I think has been where the most challenges have been. Um, you know, again, going back two years ago, this was our largest and busiest facility. Uh, you know, we, we could do half unit train capacities. Uh, we ran a 24 seven operation and our peak production throughput at, at two years ago was about 4,500 TEUs, all of agricultural commodities. Uh, that was a combination of pulses and wheat, but it really was kind of like the, the showcase terminal for what we could do for the, the grain market. Um, you know, the challenges two years ago were the ones that we kept seeing, you know, repeatedly or in some new ones. Uh, first and foremost, uh, vessel space and blank sailings, which was you know, a new development that started in the spring of 2019 and has continued over into 2020. And we're even starting to see bits and pieces of that now. Um, and peak season shortage of empties. I mean, I think like clockwork, we could you know, go into every fall of new, new harvest on the grain side and by time October, November around equipment would get tight. Um, and then reservation windows. Uh, a heavy concentration of the agricultural goods are done with specific carriers. And you know what that created sometimes was just you know, a kind of a push to get large quantity of boxes out on specific vessels. And we could have scenarios where our, our, our trucks were you know, operating at max capacity for three days a week, and then you know, almost idle for the other two days. So that was kind of that peak and valley effect. Uh, where things have really, 
gone uh, kind of upside down from our environment is like as, as I mentioned is, is how things are now moving through Van uh, the port of Vancouver on the export side. Uh, so where we used to be 24 hours a day uh, and we had upwards of 90 to 100 staff, we're now running five days a week operations, we're at 20 staff. So our, our volume and the amount of staff needed to move the grain side is, is down uh, to a quarter of what it used to be. And that's been a really big significant impact in what we've been doing. Um, the current throughput of the facility right now is about 2000 containers of transloading, um, but only a, a thousand of that is pulses. And so that, you know, a thousand of, of the grain sector side of things kind of correlates with that reduction in staffing down to a, a quarter. The other thousand is on the import side of things that I'll, I'll kind of get into in a second. Um, in addition to the throughput on the transloading side of things, what Vancouver has essentially become is a storage yard for empty and loaded containers in Vancouver. Uh, we've had to pivot our business model significantly uh, due to the lack of exports. Um, and in doing so, we've, we've taken the, the, the asset we have in the land and the equipment that we, we operate to load the containers and, and utilizing that for the container storage side. Um, this is now the primary source of our business at this stage in time. Um, our focus is still on export transloading for agricultural commodities. That's the root of the company. And when the volumes come back, uh, we'll be prepared to, to offer it. But it really has changed the dynamic there. Um, you know, what are some of the factors that have led to this? Um, one of the things that's not mentioned here on, this, on the slides uh, is that there's been a shift in, in how steamship lines have both priced and approached uh, imports into the North American marketplace. Uh, you know, traditionally, and uh, don't quote me on these numbers, this is something I've heard secondhand, so these numbers may be inaccurate, perhaps Doug might have these numbers as well. Um, but I, I had heard that approximately 75 to 80% of the traffic that used to come into Vancouver would be put onto rail for export to Eastern Canada. And that number is now, from what I'm told, down below 50%. So that additional 25 to 30% of traffic that is no longer going on the rail to go to there is now being basically housed locally in the Vancouver side. That whole notion goes to the fact that steamship lines want to turn their assets faster. Um, you know, they don't want it going 10 days into Toronto or Montreal, they want it, and then having another 10 days back, they want to discharge it into Vancouver, get it unloaded, get it on a ship, and get it out as fast as possible. Um, what this has done in the Vancouver side of things, it's, it's created a shortage for container storage, it's created a, a shortage for warehousing space, and it's created a shortage for transportation. Um, all three of those sectors and the pricings associated with it have been driven up dramatically. Um, you know, again, that's, you know, the fact that we're doing uh, storage at all at this point is kind of a byproduct of that. Um, you know, as we look from the grain side of things and what the challenges are, the biggest thing and what contributes to that, you know, that quarter of numbers is the removal of historical services. So we saw a shift, right? As carriers said, okay, I want to focus on revenue and I want to focus on getting those boxes back to Asia as soon as possible. They discontinued traditional services that we had depended on and had done tremendous volumes on for years. Services into Latin America with, with most carriers are now non-existent or fractional at best. Uh, options going into the Indian subcontinent or Middle East uh, have either disappeared or they're so expensive that it's just not feasible. So it's really put a pressure on to the system of saying, well, how can I ship through Vancouver Effective, uh, effectively if I can't reach the markets my customers want it to ship to. Um, to kind of give you like, you know, the best example of this, at one point back in uh, early June, we had 2,200 loaded, fully loaded containers going into us with one specific carrier going into a marketplace, at which point they pulled the service. And the solution was, okay, we're going to give you, you know, X number of uh, containers per ship. And 
we return those units, the final units from that situation almost three weeks ago. So we had boxes loaded idle in our facility for up to six months just because of you know the withdrawal of those services and the pressure put on things. Um, freight rates as well in the Vancouver side of things continue to be high uh, versus bulk vessels if there is lar larger quantities to do. And because of all the port congestion that we're seeing, we're seeing very narrow reservation windows uh, where if we do get the vessel space and we do have the price and all those factors line up, now we're faced with, okay, you've got to deliver 100 or 200 containers in a 24 hour period. And when you combine that with the stress on finding trucking capacity in Vancouver right now, that makes for a very daunting task to get, um, to get those exports out. So where does this leave us going forward? Uh, again, there's a lot of questions that we're asking in terms of there is, will the container rates normalize? You know, at what point does this come back to there and does it come back? You know, will traditional vessel services return? Uh, we've talked to some ocean carriers who have said, look, they may not bring back some of those Latin American services again. That it could be, you know, although they, they're projecting another 18 months as well, that it could be three, four or five years before some of these services come back and because they've found different ways to move different projects. Um, and then will the import cargo return to normal movements as well? Um, you know, will there, will there be a shift of, will there continue to be a push to discharge cargo in Vancouver? And if so, will that continue to put a stress on all the local supply chains in the greater Vancouver area? Or will steamship lines start opening up and make it more, more attractive cost-wise to move traffic eastbound, which would then allow uh, for some of the traditional uh, supply chain factors to come back into place. Um, 2022 and the crop outlook, as I mentioned for for, for Prince Rupert also applies here. Um, and where I fear, particularly from Vancouver, is that a perfect storm is brewing. And, and why do I say that? Um, if the crop outlook for next year is positive, but the supply chain factors that we're facing right now still remain in place, we're going to be stuck with an, uh, an unprecedented scenario where we're going to have tremendous demand to move cargo, the volume will be there, the physical commodities will be there, but then the supply chain, how is that going to react? You know, as a transloading company, we're adapting this year to stay afloat. And, you know, I can't speak for all my competitors, but I, you know, everybody in the marketplace, you know, who has built their business on transloading of export product is for grain has had to look in different avenues to find additional revenues. So as you go forward and you're, you're working to try to, you know, keep, keep the engine turning, so to speak, over the course of the next nine months, you know, as things turn around, we're all, we're all committed to the, uh, to the export side of things once more, but it's going to be a challenge if we can't find the drage capacity or if these you know, reservation windows become narrow, it's really going to put an, uh, a stress on it. I hope the import volume and the chaos subsides before then, um, but if it, if it continues well beyond this summer and the volumes increase on the grain side, it, it could be a, a fairly uh, stressful experience come next year. Um, on the Montreal side of things, it's, you know, it's kind of the pendulum effect of, you know, as things have developed in Vancouver, there's been kind of a shift that I'll, I'll, I'll speak to in a second on the East Coast side. Uh, so going back Two years ago, uh, this was a very small facility as far as agricultural commodities were concerned. Um, you know, we were doing manifest traffic only. We ran, you know, Monday to Friday, single shift during the day. Um, you know, our peak production we would be about 2,000 containers a month, but more often it was closer to like the 1,000 to 1,500 range. Um, in there, you know, staffing was the problem because again, it was you know, it was the opposite of what we're seeing. It was inconsistent. You know, we would get peaks and valleys and, and cargo coming in, but it really wasn't a, a push to move cargo on the east. And that in large part was a byproduct of two things. Uh, one was very high rail rates uh, to go to Montreal versus Vancouver. Um, and the second was, you know, competition versus source load where some customers found it more advantageous to simply load their cargoes in the prairies versus the added cost to go east. Um, as we look to the current situation, um, 
we're, we're now running 24 seven operations here. So as I alluded to in Vancouver, where we sh shrunk the staff by, you know, down to a quarter of what we have, the opposite has occurred in Montreal, where we've had to quadruple the staff uh, in order to meet the demand. Um, as the services have disappeared off the West Coast, customers have shifted their volume to the East Coast to kind of fill that void. Um, so the peak production volume right now is, is about 4,500 TEUs per month through this site. Um, just under half of which is pulses. Um, and a byproduct of that is that as you know, pulses, or sorry, as you know, the grain side of things was relatively slow over the course of the last decade, uh, we made a, a shift as a company to try to get into different commodities, to try to get into that cargo diversification side of things. We moved, uh, we do a lot more soybeans currently at our facility. Uh, we are doing forest products here as well. Um, because again, the grain was so inconsistent. But now, as you know, those that have come, the grain has come back um, to levels that we haven't seen since 2007 or 2008. It's really put a stress on on how you try to coordinate everything at the same time. Um, so the biggest challenges we currently face in the in the Montreal side is that significant volume east, and it's something that has come um, quite painful, in all honesty. Um, there's been inconsistent rail services um, to start with, uh, more on the local level, not on the, the line hall movements to get here. And that's simply because, you know, as a facility, they, they were used to serving, servicing us, you know, three days a week. And that was okay, uh, simply based on the, the volume and the demand. But as we tried to shift to six days a week per service or seven days a week service to try to unload and to meet the growing demands, um, they weren't prepared from a staffing perspective in order to, to, to do that. It has significantly improved since, but it, it was a learning curve throughout that process. Um, the same thing can be said for shortages of empties. Um, Montreal has traditionally been one of those locations that has been flush with empties. Um, and to the point that there were so many empties on the East Coast, they were repositioning them to Western Canada for source load boxes. Um, with the shift in, in volume going uh, east, uh, it's really been a challenge this year. We have been well short on equipment and kind of those, you know, experiences that we faced on the west coast year after year have now kind of shifted over the east coast as well. Uh, once again, the, the situation is improving um, here. I think that's just, a, you know, as ocean carriers are learning um, that it is going to be here to stay for, a, a, you know, at least a midterm period of time. Um, so it is more optimistic on that side. Um, what I have heard though, is that that's also come at the expense of source load. So as carriers are now trying to make a decision as to where to put those empty containers, um, if there is containers in the East, um, they can reposition them to Montreal very fast and get them loaded on a ship, or they can make a choice to load the, bring them again, let's say seven to 10 days inland loading into you know Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and then another 10 days back to Montreal. Well, in that 20 days that can go there and back, they can, they can do a lot more asset utilization and turn time. So um, as one problem is, is kind of being fixed, another one is emerging. Um, so what, what lies ahead from a challenge perspective um, is you know, what happens to the Vancouver marketplace really has an impact on what happens to Montreal. Uh, because of those rail rates that I referred to, Montreal is not the preferred option. Um, if Vancouver does normalize, the volume will go back. Um, but if the Vancouver struggles continue, despite those rail rate differentials, Montreal will be the only viable option for a lot of these destinations and will continue to grow. So we're kind of keeping it both eye on both coasts simultaneously to try to juggle uh, how we do things. Um, and then with that being said, will the empty equipment flows improve to meet demand? Um, you know, we're optimistic on that. But again, you know, if volumes continue to grow and, and outpace how the steamship lines are reacting, um, that could be a challenge. Um, and then again, you know, more of a demand for existing commodities versus agri increased agricultural is, again, that whole balancing act of, you know, as you you plan for something to not be there and then it comes back is where that real struggle comes into play. 
Um, and again, so if, and that kind of alludes to the Vancouver comment I made a few minutes ago, if, if we're building something because grain is not there and it comes back, then what happens a year from now? Um, on the Montreal side of things, uh, we do have an expansion project that's been in the works uh, for a number of years. Uh, I say a number of years because there's been some challenges to say the least on that project uh, that I won't go in specifically today, but uh, that expansion project will take our 12 acre site that we have in the picture here to a 60 acre site that's across the street from the Port of Montreal. And that'll allow us to do um, a lot more diversity, uh, car cargo storage, and, and get into larger quantities of, of grain and try to make some of those economics work. So, you know, if that volume does continue um, to go east in as we go forward, we'll be able to meet those demands. Uh, and so that's all I have for today. Thank you, Stephen. You got you got good at presenting. <laughs> uh, uh, so we're going to take some questions in the chat. And Barry, you've got like a three lined up there. So maybe you could uh, unmute yourself and, and take that. Uh, but but I, while, while Stephen was there, I was just going to ask a little bit about that perfect storm. That you, were, you were essentially talking about perfect storm related to grains and, and containers. Is that right? That's correct, yes. That, like given, given the how, how empty the, the storage is on the prairies this year, I don't think we're going to get like a 2014 oversupply into the system for the bulk side, even though we're looking at probably people pouring the inputs onto this, uh, given the prices they're, uh, they're looking at. Okay, Barry, uh, let, let you go. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Derek. I do have, uh, you know, this, this very uh, nice panel and it raises lots of questions and, and interesting uh, possibilities. Uh, one I'd like to address to Peter first is, you know, are there any general lessons that we can learn from the impact of the pandemic that, uh, or is it just so unique that, you know, it's just another thing and we have better just prepared for the unexpected in the future? Yeah, in my view, it's, it's that, um, you know, uh, so I, I should, I should start by saying that at the tender and impressionable young age of 51, I'm a, a PhD candidate in economics. So I, I say this because I've spent a lot of time doing econometrics over the last few years. And I think econometrics is a great, for, this is more for the economist, obviously, but I think it's a great exercise in determining relationships and sort of looking at the way things work. Uh, but in the real world, it's all very qualitative. And, uh, and, and, and you know, second and third derivatives and all that sort of thing are, are, are an interesting way of grasping concepts. But I really think that we need to teach economics differently. And, and, and my view is that you know, it'd be much better if, if I could teach everybody about the concept of lag in terms of policy and, and that sort of thing and unintended consequences and a number of, 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 of lessons of economics where uh, you don't you don't look at numbers or lines, but you describe things phenomenologically. I think I think that's that that should be one of the major takeaways here. And I, and I mentioned at the end of my talk, I said something about um, I really believe that 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 even our, our, our policymakers view things very mechanistically. They view, you know, pull this lever, this happens, and that sort of thing. And that's very at odds with what we see out there. I, I think the economy should be looked at as, 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 as a very, very, the world economy, not just a national economy, should be viewed as a, you know, sort of a, an intricate ballet, which is very intricate, very easily upset, rather than a machine that you can shut off and turn back on at will. Um, this, this was, this was a one-off in, in a sense in the modern era. Um, so there is some plausible deniability. There is some excuses can be made, but um, let's hope it doesn't happen again. Does that, uh, does that suffice or? Yeah, thank you, Peter. Yes, well, certainly, uh, you know, the econometrics is great. I, nobody's ever predicted <laughs> a turning point. And I heard one uh, description <laughs> of uh, that as uh, driving into the future, looking in the rearview mirror. Right. And, uh, that's part of the problem of trying to predict these unusual events. And I guess you, all you do is cope with them. And Stephen has certainly given us a, a large uh, a number of instances of how, how firms must just sort of react quickly to the, to the events and change and adjust. And, and yeah. it, uh, looks like a, a tremendous job you've done as well, Stephen, on that. The, 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 more, uh, the, the more I learn, the more I'm surprised that it ever works. Than that it doesn't work sometimes. 
Yeah, I think this has been a great uh, case study year of how pivot works. And, and Stephen, maybe you could speak to a little bit of, you did, I guess, already, a bunch of the pivots you had to do with this. Uh, but I think sort of to get, to get to the root of Peter's answer about econometrics, it's almost like the strategic management process, getting looking at everything and getting ready for the next uh, shock is really what you got to prepare for, even when you're dealing with this complex role of, of logistics. And I think part of that too, just to add to what Peter said is that, you know, a lot of these things are just, these decisions are made in isolation, right? Like where people are expecting to kind of pull that lever and get the, the consequence that they desire. And I, you know, I alluded to that with the steamship lines in terms of, you know, they wanted to make this asset utilization decision and let's get more containers, you know, discharged in Vancouver versus, you know, going on rail East. And, you know, in doing so, while they were trying to increase, you know, the turn times of their assets, you could probably argue that they've probably reduced it because instead of, instead of containers getting loaded to rail and going to, you know, established infrastructure in the East, they're now getting bottlenecked, sitting on the ports in Vancouver, waiting for warehousing space, waiting in container yards like ourselves, dwelling there instead and at a different cost. So, you know, it's, it's one of those push-pull things where, you know, you have to look at the whole supply chain and what the ripple effects of a decision are gonna have. And unfortunately for a lot of these decision makers on the container side, is there, you know, they are in Asia or they're in, in Europe, they don't understand the Canadian supply chain. Um, and so they're, they, we get a lot of piggyback decisions based on what happens in the United States, for example, without really any forethought to what specifically drives Canada's economics. If I might just add on to uh, Stephen's comments, I think that's very insightful. And I think from a 30,000 foot level, we actually see uh, the impacts of disparate supply chains rolling over into other supply chains. Um, and, and to the degree of which any outage, if you like, has shown its, its, uh, its features in the past. And I think it just serves us to understand this supply chain, i.e. a major uh, infrastructure for Canada, uh, that we need to look at it holistically from all of those perspectives. We need to have a, an ability to understand that individual decisions in one's particular supply chain may inadvertently impact negatively other supply chains, sub-optimizing the entire greater supply chain, if that makes sense. So we need to start measuring things. We need to start looking at things from a, a larger perspective with the anticipation that at any given time, a supply chain may fail and may have rollover impacts. So uh, we have to have resiliency and we need to be thinking five, 10, 15 years out, uh, which is often the time necessary to build the infrastructure to create that resiliency. So uh, anyway, that's uh, an oversight I had. Thanks. I just wanted to point out if you'd like to ask a question, you can you can put it into the chat. Um, Doug, I did have a question. We were talking about you know kind of some environmental pro uh, uh, goals right in the port, but I was looking at the container uh, islands there, and it's like, uh, what happens if we get increase in sea levels? Like oh, those things look like they're they're a little bit risky for 50 years from now. Absolutely. So we've been aware of the prediction of rising sea levels for a number of years. And uh, the port has uh, engaged in uh, the work of understanding what the timing and what the requirements will be for shoring up, if you like, the at-risk zones. Uh, so we have been uh, running uh, satellite imagery, uh, looking at the relative land masses that would be impacted by a 100-year uh, 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 weather event and or tidal influence or, or storm, and uh, indeed are prioritizing uh, not just for supply chain uh, advancement, but uh, for maintaining the infrastructure of the federal lands that on which we conduct that business. So we've identified those, uh, those risk points, what is at risk now, what do we need to be looking at in the future? And that will include things like uh, raising the, the level of the birth faces, uh, those floodplains that need to have 
uh, perhaps dikes or, or necessary uh, uh, containment, um, as well as perhaps those particular pieces of land that simply will no longer sustain that activity and finding replacements. And I'd like to add, um, our president is on record in that uh, we, we've run out of industrial land in Vancouver. Um, now, is that, is that a problem that cannot be overcome? Um, it can be, but at this time, there is not the support to overcome this issue. And where it lies is the, the working together of the federal, provincial, and municipal governments so that we have proper zoning to protect industrial land for increasing Canada's economy. Uh, at present, those discussions aren't going forward in a mean, meaningful way, and uh, we're, we're announcing the, the alarm bells. The next interruption of supply chains may not be a weather event. It may be a Canadian grown event. It may be the shortage of land that was not addressed when we could address it. And uh, we're, we're uh, our president just announced at the Vancouver Board of Trade that uh, we need to sit down we need to understand what are the requirements in this region for Canada's largest gateway to continue to provide us trade advantages. Otherwise, as Stephen mentioned, industry is looking for alternatives and uh, that will cost more and potentially take longer and will not optimize our ability to trade. So uh, those discussions uh, are a message that need to take place. Thanks. Stephen, I was wondering about your comment on the transport to the south. You know, our next session is going to talk about Mexico and the, the shipping to uh, Latin America. And, and Peter, I'll bring you in as well because you've written on cabotage recently. If we had a, a, a better cabotage uh, regime in, in North America between Canada, the US and Mexico, would we be able to have better feeder systems along that coast and service uh, to Latin America? I, I can start or, or, or anyone else wants to jump in. Uh, go ahead, Peter. Oh, thank you. So, um, so that's definitely the case. And also, I mean, uh, one of the added benefits is that uh, it would also reduce on the pollution that uh, and then the, the emissions that come from so much cross country trucking and, and other forms of transportation. Um, the uh, the, the, the situation with respect to the Jones Act, which I've also written about in the US, is such that uh, when you really realize why it's in, when you realize what's in, what, why it's in place and, 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 and the basis upon which it, it endures, um, it becomes all the more galling. It really protects uh, a very small handful, really an oligopoly of, um, of shipping producers and a couple of um, favored uh, collective bargaining uh, entities. And uh, the, the US and Canada both have uh, on both of our, uh, mostly on our, on our west, but I believe on our east as well, uh, uh, ports and on our shorelines, uh, uh, depths and terrains which were made for this sort of thing. It's, it's, it's really, it's a tremendous missed opportunity that if I uh, get out from under the pile of things I'm under right now, I may eventually try to just sort of create a, um, a sort of a back of envelope sketch of how much has been lost by not having the opportunity to move things along ports. Uh, along, along coasts, rather. And then just to add, Barry, to your question, when I was referring to Latin America, uh, primarily South America is the most impacted areas. We do have a little bit in the Central American side, but when you're going to, um, whether it be Chile or uh, Colombia or Ecuador, Brazil, places like that, again, those services are were we're just, those are the ones I was referring to that are disappearing the most. And where carriers are, are saying, well, you know, we have established services through the Gulf. We have services off the East Coast and utilize that. And they're actually looking at that as the future of, you know, to sustainable trade. So, you know, uh, we, the CPKCS um, merger was mentioned. That'll provide more options that maybe hit some transloading options down in the Gulf in years to come that didn't previously exist. But I think carriers are really relooking at how they're servicing certain lanes in light of this. I do got a question from the chat I'd like to throw in here. This is from Greg Northy. Uh, uh, he was saying that the, the pulse sector is being particularly impacted by the container disruptions. The U.S. has put a particular focus on this issue, and the House recently passed the Ocean Reform Act, the Ocean Shipping Reform Act. And uh, Greg is interested in hearing Peter's thoughts on this act and whether those the kinds of requirements it, it, it will place on shipping lines with regards to exports will be useful. 
and are there other options? So I have not really dug into the Ocean Shipping Reform Act that much, but if I understand correctly, and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, it's essentially trying to put in place a sort of um, uh, um, uh, industrial policy whereby uh, more will take place on U.S. shores. Is that correct, or have I confused it with something else? Because in in, in the wake of uh, the shipping problems, there's been a lot of legislation which has been proposed. I don't know what's made it to the floor or not, so I may not be equipped to answer this exactly. My, my general response to, to all sort of industrial policy questions is um, comparative advantage is what it is because it's proven itself over years. And uh, politicians who are trying to draw certain uh, either industries or, or certain manufacturing func functions back to US shores um, because of a policy decision that they made is probably wrongheaded. And, uh, and, and generally speaking, things get the way they are either because they've been interfered with or because certain countries have proven better at doing certain things. I mean, we've known that since, uh, since Ricardo's writings, you know, uh, 220 years ago. So um, I, just generally speaking, I'm suspicious of, uh, of new shoring or onshoring efforts, especially when uh, uh, they're being proposed in light of some, some really knee-jerk policy decisions, which, uh, I've proven not only uh, unnecessary, but uh, wholly ineffective and, and generated costs vastly in excess of anything they could be argued to have saved or, or, or you know, any, any uh, uh, occasions they could have remedied, in my opinion. Is it being addressed partly through the price mechanism of containers? Is that Certainly, I mean, I mean, ultimately, ultimately, we all face rationing, right? It's the, the question is whether the rationing takes place through prices or through or through decrees. And um, the price system has, with lumber and with semiconductors, which I also wrote about, uh, and with a number of other uh, areas that have that seen shortages, the, the price system is is acting. Um, the question again, the question becomes whether you want to circumvent that or or. or um, whether as a matter of policy, we want to let that process, um, uh, you know, play out and have industry respond and bring in more containers. And, you know, I, I mentioned the pallets before. Um, companies did respond and they created plastic pallets when, when, when the price of, uh, of, of lumber got out of hand, as it appears to be again. Uh, and so, so these things do respond. They just often don't happen in the amount of time that people would like. And uh, that's a different issue entirely. Uh, just a qu quick comment from... Chris Ferris, that the just getting better visibility into the supply chains would be useful for all of us. I think uh, you were talking about uh, measurements there, and I think Doug was talking about understanding all these implications of all these different uh, choices. Just more data on what's going on in the supply chains does seem like a, a good thing in general. Then you can run more econometric models. All right, guys, we're at uh, uh, 10. 19. Uh, so we it's scheduled a little bit over uh, on, on the break. Barry, is this the time to take a break or we could? So this is our stretch and bend break. Okay. So I think we should uh, take that and, and we'll return uh, uh, with rail to Mexico. And uh, I think we'll have a very interesting and exciting presentation. So everyone, if you can come back uh, at 1030, uh, we'll start again. And thank uh, again, you, Derek, for sharing this and to our panelists. I think this was a really interesting uh, session and, and a great start to the day. And thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your great presentation.